This week we are wrapping up our series called Five Questions You'll Be Glad You Asked. And if this is your first week with us, this is a good week to be with us because we're kind of wrapping things up here. You kind of get the whole thing bite sized. Uh, and we'll catch you up a little bit. But if you've been with us every single week so far, you know, or at least we're part of the series, you know that we've been talking about, really, we've been talking about the power of decisions decisions. If you think about where you are in life or the people you admire, the people you respect, where they are in life, how they got to where they are and why they are the way that they are, what we said really is that it comes back to decisions. Decisions. Now, sure, sure, there are some things in your life that you can't control, right? You can't, you have no control over the hand that you've been dealt, but if the, the, the part of your life that you can control, if it has a steering wheel, it's your decisions. We said that your decisions have the power to determine the direction and the quality of your life, where you're going, what your life is like along the way. Now, whenever you have to make a decision. You've got some options in front of you. You have an opportunity. You have to decide to do it, not do it, go, don't go, say it, don't say it, right? You take your options and you put them through a question filter, whether you realize you do this or not. Maybe you don't articulate the questions, but there are some things we do pretty naturally, like, right? Like questions like, will it make me happy? Is it worth it? How much is it going to cost? Is this going to be fun? Is it going to hurt? Who is this going to involve? Who is it going to affect? Right? We ask all these questions and then we kind of decide. And a lot of times we ask the questions without even realizing or articulating it. But what we've said over the past few weeks is like, what if we took this filter made up of these questions and added five of them? Or maybe even replaced your old questions with these five questions. What we said is that these five questions may have the power to determine the direction and the quality of your life. So what are the five questions? Well, on week one, we talked about that salesman inside of you, salesperson, associate inside of you, that's like, oh, you should do this, but you know it's really not good for you, right? Or maybe you don't. It's, it's the voice that starts to do the convincing when convincing needs to be done and often leads us to making choices that we would not advise anybody else make, right? And so we said, okay, really to handle this self-deception, the question we have to ask is, am I being honest with myself? Really, really. Like when it comes to why I want to do what I want to do, why do I really want to say it, to go there, to do that, to buy that? Really, deep down, uh, Brene Brown, if you're familiar with her, she calls this emotional curiosity, kind of doing a little digging. It helps disarm that salesman. On week two, what we talked about is our emotions and how our emotions can blind us when it comes to making a process. And you know this, you know, if you've ever been like filled with anger, it's really hard to do anything other than what your anger is leading you to do or desire. It's like all you could see is the thing that you want so bad. It's called focalism. And our emotions really play a part in that. And it's hard to just silence the, demotion, the emotions. We can't remove them, but we can redirect them. And so we said, what if we took our emotions instead of right now and we, we move those emotions to the future and said, okay, when this situation, my circumstances, this season I'm in right now, when it's just a story, what story do I want to tell? You'd be amazed if you ask that question. You'd be amazed to see how all of a sudden you're given a little bit of perspective. All of a sudden the thing you wanted so bad because it loses a little bit of its luster. Then the, the next week we talked about, you know, that internal, sometimes that sense of pushback, you know, like, oh, hold on a second. Maybe you call it conscience. Some people would say it's God's spirit inside of you, but there's something that kind of like checks you. And a lot of times we just plow through that feeling, right? Like just shh, and we keep going. We said, if there's something that's bothering you, what if you let it bother you until you figured out why it bothered you? Like, what if there is, we said, if there's an internal tension 
that deserves my attention. And at least, at least define it, at least figure out why it's bothering you, even if you don't do anything about it, at least define it. Then the next week, last week, we talked about the line. Remember the line, it was a big red line if you were here, between right and wrong. You know, especially in the church, we like love to talk about right and wrong. And so a lot of times we'll be like, well, is it wrong? The question will be, is it wrong? Is it wrong? And really what we're saying is like, how far can I, how close can I get to that line without crossing it? And we're settling for the lowest, absolute like lowest possible choice that we can make. But what if instead of getting super close to the line, we turned around and said, not is it wrong, but is it wise? Like what's, what's the wise thing? To do, And you'd be amazed how many options all of a sudden appear before you. So today we're on our last question. We're wrapping it up. By the way, on your way out, we're going to hand out some cards if you want them. They've got all the questions. So you can put it on your fridge or your dashboard or in your phone case or your, the little visor in your car, wherever you keep things like that. Um, last question. So I'll tell you a story uh, before I tell you the question, of course. So last year, my son Logan decided he wanted to play football. He was five years old at the time. We signed him up for tackle football, five years old, accidentally. That's true. We did not know it was going to be tackle football. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we thought it was going to be flag until we had to get the pads, and then we just did it because we did. So he's got no idea how football works, right? And his coach was a phenomenal coach, but uh, he struggled a little bit communicating to kids who had no idea what the deal was with football. And so he's got all this equipment on. He looks like just a pile of pads. He doesn't know why. He doesn't know why he's got all these pads on. The coach is telling him to like get on the line and I'm looking at him and he's like, what line? Like, what are we doing? What's tackling? He doesn't understand any of it. And at one point he just started in the middle of practice, he just started to cry. And I'm like, you don't do that on the football field. But <laughs> I like pulled him aside. I pulled him aside and I tried to get super, super simple, right? And I was like, all right, okay. Let, let's like just break it down real simple. Like you and your team are trying to get the ball over there. The other team is trying to get the ball that way. You don't want them to get the ball that way. If you see someone running that way, just grab them, hold on, and don't let go. And if somehow you find yourself with the ball and you forget the play, you forget the formation, you don't understand what the coach is saying, but you have the ball, just turn and run that way. And he looks at me and he's like, to the fence? And I was like, yeah, run to the fence. And all of a sudden, it was amazing. Even that like simple explanation, it just had a way of ordering things. All of a sudden he understood like why, why you would practice tackling, why you'd practice throwing the ball and catching the ball. It had this ability to kind of like put things in place. It's as if to say, if there's one thing, if there's, you forget it all, you forget all the ins and outs. You can't remember that if there's just one like fence that you run to, it's that one. It's that one. He loved it so much. He's not doing it again this year. He hated it. <laughs> we're moving on. Now we're, we're um, playing the game where you get the ball through the metal circle. Yeah. Uh, but the reason I approach it that way with him is because that's how I need things to be handed to me. Like I need to know when the wheels fall off, like just what's the one thing? What's the main thing? What's the, is there just one thing you can tell me? Okay, just do this or don't do that. And the question that we're looking at today does that in two ways. First, if you've been with us for this whole series and you're like, darn it, I forgot my card. I can't remember the questions. You know, there's something about attention and honest and like, and, but, but you just need one. This last question will send you in the right direction. It's, it's the fallback. It's the catch-all. But this question at the same time, if you're, if you're somebody who considers themselves a follower of Jesus, or even if you're just curious, like maybe you're kicking the tires trying to figure out what the whole church thing is about, and you wanna know, all right, is there a way to just kind of sum this up? This one question, if there's ever a point where you're wondering, like, what does God, if there's a God, what does he want me to do? This one question will send you in the right direction. 
It's one question. It's one main thing. And so when Jesus was around, he said a lot of things. Like he, he gave a lot of messages. He had a lot of talks. He had a lot, you know, a lot of sermons. Last week we talked about the Sermon on the Mount. He addressed every different topic. He put his fingers in every area of everybody's life, right? He said a lot of things, but then at the end of his life, he knew that his time was coming to an end. And he said that, he expressed it. He knew he only had like hours to live. And he sat down with the group of people, we call them the disciples. They were his closest followers. They were eating dinner. Uh, we call it the last supper. It was a big meal. The last time he would be with them before he died. And they had heard all of his teachings, all of his different lessons, but he gave them a fence to run to. Like you remember all the different things I've said? Well, I, I, he says, I have a new command. Like the other things you see them as teachings, you see them and not that they're not important, but this, this is a command that I'm giving you. You know, Moses back then, if you know Moses, right? They had the 10 commandments, they had 10 of them. They went on to be way more than 10 hundreds. Actually, he's like, I'm giving you one, one, one thing. He says, a new command I give you, love one another, love one another. Like, not, not like just be nice or like always have a smile or always like try to, you know, make things sound really good, but just like genuinely be concerned for other people. We could say be, because love in our culture has become one of those things that means a million things and kind of it means nothing at the same time. It, like we could say for the purpose of what Jesus said to love someone is to to want and to be willing to work for their well-being, to be in their corner and be willing to do something about it. And he's saying like, that is the thing. If the wheels fall off, if you forgot what I said about how you should treat this and how you should handle that conversation and this conversation and, and, and how, like how you're supposed to act when that happens, if you forget all that, you just remember this right here. In any and every situation, you ask the question, question five, ask the question for those who are involved in whatever is about to happen, directly or indirectly, the question you ask is in this situation, what does love require of me? And sometimes it'll be what you would think, you know, like playful, nice, caring, kind, all that. But other times it's gonna be hard. And you know this, if you have good friends, I'm sure there have been times where they showed you tough love, where they said the difficult thing out of love for you because to not say it would not have been loving. And if you're a parent, I'm sure you know, sometimes you gotta do stuff that's really hard, difficult that you don't wanna do because to not do it would not be loving. And he's saying, do this all the time all the time, let this be the one thing. But it's hard sometimes. You know, just uh, about a week ago, our kids went out, they spent the day with our friends and they had both of our kids. Allie and I had no kids, it was like glory. And uh, they ate dinner and they came back really late. And they were even dropped off at our house, which is the best. And the mother, her name's Kim, she's actually downstairs in the nursery. She comes out, we're talking, we're joking around, you know, she's telling us how the day went, telling us about you know, Mia and Logan, six years old, Logan and Mia is eight. And she's like, oh yeah, they were great, a lot of fun. She's like, oh, I gotta tell you though, your kids are so funny. Don't tell them I told you, but I got them pizza. And when I put the pizza out, Logan looks at it and goes, I don't want pizza. Do you have macaroni and cheese? And I was like, oh yeah? And she's like, yeah. And then Mia, she goes, you know, a lot of times when we have pizza at home, mommy like cuts up something else. We, have, we don't just have pizza. And she was like, oh. And I was like, oh. <laughs> she's like, yeah, but don't tell them. And I'm like, mm. And I just didn't say anything. Uh, so, you know, we finished talking and we apologized on behalf of our children. And then we went inside. 
We went inside, my kids, they were happy, everybody was happy, the mood was light, but we sat our kids down in their bedroom. And I said, all right, I know you guys had a lot of fun today, I know Miss Kim, really nice, uh, but I heard about what happened at dinner, how you were offered something, and you, you said you wanted something else instead and in addition to. And I was like, that, and, and we unpacked that and, and explained, like, for us, and this is not parenting advice, but for, for us, that, like, when you're offered something, you take it and you say thank you, right? And so we explained this to our kids, and for our kids, like, dessert is a really big thing in our house, and sometimes to get them to remember things, we have to enforce some consequences. And so we said, okay, so tomorrow night, we're not going to have dessert. And they both looked at me and they were upset and they're, you know, whatever, tears in their eyes, they went to bed. And I walked out and I was like, you know, I just feel like I rained on their parade. They had such a nice day with their friends and we got to come in and be like the mean parents that just right on top of everything. But like what stopped me from going back into the room? Well, first it was Allie, but secondly, (laughs) it was my love for them. Like, I want them to be the kind of kids that people want around. To not say something would be undermining their well-being. And so we taught them a hard lesson because in that moment, that's what love required of us. And so it won't always be easy, but that's what Jesus is, is inviting us to. What, this, this is, like, what's great about this question is twofold. Like I said earlier, One, if you don't believe in any of this Jesus stuff and you're just like, all right, I'm just here because those earlier questions seem to be kind of helpful. This still, I think, can be really helpful for you. If you're in a situation where you forget, you're like, okay, I forgot this question or that question, and, and the only thing you can remember is what does love require of me? You may not see an immediate return. Like people may not like cheer for you. You may not feel like you got your money's worth. Or what, but if you stop and ask, what does it look like in this situation for the people that are involved to work for their good? What I can promise you is that 99 times out of 100, you're not going to look back with any sense of regret like you'll look back and think maybe that didn't work out exactly how I wanted to, but, but I'm proud of the story I can tell, even if you don't believe any of this. In fact, if you think back at hard decisions when you chose to choose someone else over yourself, how often do you look back and say, I wish I never did that? There is something internally, like, as if we were wired to live that way. And so it's a great parachute question if you forget all the other ones. But if you're a follower of Jesus, this is the main thing. This is it. Some people would say that all of his teachings and all of his followers that came after him who expounded on his teaching, it's all just more details articulation of this one command. If you go back and you look at the other things he said and you really dive into it and you look at it and be like, is is this really a form of looking for the well-being of other people, the answer every time is yes. It was always motivated by love for people. I was talking to someone who was like pretty new to the whole church thing. And she was like, when I heard somebody say, this is what it's all about, it just clicked. Like that's, that's, that's the thing. Later on, this guy, Paul, would write a lot about Jesus and the things that he taught. In fact, his writings later became most of the New Testament. And he said in a number of different places, if you get it all right, but you miss love for people, you miss the whole thing. If you know everything, but you miss love for people. If you, if you got all the church things, all your ducks in a row, but you don't care for other people, you missed it because this was the one thing. This is the one question. In fact, to, to one church that was arguing about the rules, is it okay if we do this? Should we make people do that? Like church politics early on in the life of the church. He said this in his letter to them. This is in a letter we call it the letter to the Galatians. He says, The only thing that counts is faith. And what does that look like? Confidence, having confidence in God. What does that look like? He says, the only thing that counts is faith and it's going to be expressing itself through love. That's what it's all about. If you're wondering what it looks like to grow spiritually as a follower of Jesus, it's doing this better. 
If you wanna talk about like deep, which is a conversation that comes up often in the church, we're like, oh, let's go deep. Can we talk about the background? I wanna know about the Last Supper. And I wanna know the details. What was the weather that day? And what, you know, what percentage of alcohol was the wine? And was there gravy at the Last Supper? And we want like, we love like knowledge, especially if you've been in the church for a while. We love knowledge, but really going deep is understanding how to carry this out more effectively. If, if we know it all, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's, it's bad to know a lot of theology or biblical information, but if we miss this, we miss everything. This is, this is the, the main thing. And it's, it's the fence that we run to. And so like maybe you're reading this, maybe you're a ca- careful reader where Jesus says a new command I give to you. And you're like, okay, hold on a second. New, like what's new about that? He says, love one another as I have loved you. He's taken it from, remember like love others, like treat others the way you wanna be treated. Love your neighbor as yourself. He's saying, no, not, this is new, a new standard. Like you watch what I do. He had just finished washing their feet, which was gross. Not just because feet are gross, but because of the world that they lived in. They would have been walking through dirt roads with animal droppings all over them. And he got down on the ground and cleaned them. And later on, he would offer his life for them while they were abandoning him. Like when they turned their backs on him, he ex- like showed his greatest expression of love by giving his life for them. It's like, that's my standard of love. They had all experienced it and would continue to experience it. Just a few weeks ago, there was somebody who came to the church and knocked on the door and asked for money, which is not totally uncommon. But for us, like our policy here, what we do is we refer people to food banks and we try to support them because they have a system to make sure things are being done fairly and it's just easier. So somebody comes and knocks at the door and I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm not, we don't give out cash. And so I'm explaining this to them and the person got like really, really angry uh, very angry, like very aggressive. Eventually like Tom came and walked out and stood next to me. And this man looks at me and just spits in my face. Not like splash zone spit, you know, but like coming at you. And I just looked at him and that like made me pretty unhappy. Uh, and I just was like, okay, you're going to have to talk to Tom now. And I went inside. Uh, A little while later, I was on the phone with a pastor. Uh, This guy, I was just kind of telling him everything that had been going on at the church. He's someone who's helped us start the church. And I was telling him what had happened that day. And he's like, okay, you know, we're about to get off the phone. He's like, can I pray for you before we get off the phone? I was like, sure, you wanna pray, let's pray. So he prays and he's like, thank you God that you love this guy who spit and lose face. And I was like, speak for yourself. No, I didn't say that. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Like that morning, that morning, like I was getting ready for the day. I was doing some reading, doing some praying. And I just asked God to help me appreciate him throughout the day. Like help me see a side of you that I haven't seen before. Sometimes in church, things can get, even working in a church, it can get routine and mundane. And, and immediately, like I remembered when he said that, I remembered praying that prayer and also remembered how people like literally spat in Jesus's face like while he was going to the cross for them. And what became so clear in that moment is that like when when it becomes clear how how much Jesus loves people that spit in his face, it becomes so clear how much I don't. And yet this is the standard that he's invited us to. This is the kind of thing that has the power to, to change lives and change the world. When you love people and it doesn't make much sense. So he, he continues though, and, and this is really in this verse, let's put the verse back up here. He, he says, a new command I give to you as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now that's the standard, right? Like he's taken the standard and just jacked it up, but it's also the source. He's saying like, I want you to show the love to other people that you have already received from me. That's what makes this possible. In other words, like we can show love to the kind of people that like it feels like they have just spat in our faces 
only because we are loved by a God whose love does not change for us, even if we spit in his face. And it's like, this is, this is the heart of what we believe. A lot of people, like we feel and we live as if we do the right thing as the requirement for God's love. But what Jesus is saying here and what this whole thing is built on is that like we listen to him not as the requirement for his love, but in response to his love for us. It's, it's love that we're reciprocating, not love that we're initiating. And that's the kind of love that has the power to, to change everything. And Jesus even said that right after this, he said, and by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples, my followers, my students, in case you didn't catch it, if you love one another. This kind of love, not just like nice, all the, but the love that often doesn't make sense. That is the kind of love that has the power to change the world. And the church, when it first started, it did change the world in the first several hundred years. They didn't have like a nice Bible with gold pages and leather. They knew that there was a guy who died, came back to life, and he said, love one another. And they were like, all right. And they did. And it, tur- it turned the world upside down. The... the this is the main thing for the church. If you've got questions about the church, like what's the church? This was always supposed to be the main thing. This was supposed to be the fence that we run to, like taking care of people. I don't know if you have like been around or listened to the way people talk about the church or even how you feel about the church yourself, but the church has become a place that's known for leveraging guilt and shame and making people feel worse than they already do. It was never the plan. There was one main thing. And if we miss this, if we miss this, we miss everything. So we're gonna wrap up uh, and I'm gonna ask the band to come back up here. But I'm gonna keep my stool. Maybe you've been with us over the past couple of weeks or maybe this is your first week with us and you heard our questions. And maybe you've got a big decision in front of you. Maybe you're in a season right now where there's a crossroad. Maybe your, your, your circumstances, maybe every time we talk, there's something that keeps coming to mind. And maybe you wrestle with the first question, like, Am I being honest with myself? Like, am I really being honest with myself? And, and you tried to figure things out and, and, and maybe that brought you some clarity, but maybe you're still not sure. Maybe you stopped and thought, all right, when this is just a story, what's the story I wanna tell? And maybe you're like, well, I could tell this story, I could tell this story. And there's still a little bit of, there's still a lack of clarity. Maybe you, you've like done some real deep soul searching You've looked for an internal tension and you've given that tension attention, but you're still lacking a little bit of clarity. Maybe you've asked like, what's the wise thing to do? And you're still not sure. I'm willing to bet that if you stop and you think with all the people involved, what does love require of me? The hard thing about this question is, is it has the ability to make things painfully clear. Painfully clear. In, in, in my marriage, with where we are right now, what does love require of me? What does it look like to work for the well being of the other person in this relationship? With my kids, what does love require of me? With my parents, with my family, with my coworkers, with my boss, with my extended family, with my in-laws, what does love require of me? With the, the person in my life that really gets on my nerves, or maybe we could even say with the person, the person who like, it feels like they just spit in my face. What does love require of me? 
If you're a follower of Jesus, this is the main thing. This is, this is the fence that we run to. But if you're not, if you're not, and you're brave enough to ask this question and act on it, I'm willing to bet, I'm willing to bet that you'll be glad you did. <laughs>